there we go. So we want to make sure that we we get kind of through the through the agenda and materials, but I also want to make sure we get the public a chance to comment. So without further ado, if we get if we get too far again, I might push it to the end. But um, but is, is there anyone with public anyone who has public comment? Hi, Kristen. Hi there, Wesley. Yeah. Good evening, everybody. Um, should I go ahead or? So right ahead. We want to take a list of other people. Okay. Um, so this is a statement prepared by the um, Police Accountability uh, Working Group or Committee, whichever one you want to call us, um, commenting on some issues from the last public safety meeting. Um, and I'll provide everybody with a copy of this um, tomorrow morning. Um, at the last public safety meeting, Chief Nimber provided the trustees and public with inaccurate information. The state statute does not require that language threatening prosecution be included on the complaint form. The lawyers confirm this, um, and both Madison and Milwaukee do not include the language threatening prosecution for false statements. We're not certain why this inaccurate information was provided, but we find it problematic. Um, the short moving forward, short solidarity, solidarity network um, co uh, organized Police Accountability Committee has attempted a number of times to collaborate with the police. And while they've been pleasant, um, the police have been pleasant, there's been no substantive engagement. Chief Nimmer did not mention our work on the complaint process at the previous public safety meeting. Um, and in our efforts to collaborate with the police, they've been resistant at every step. For example, they refused to make an electronic copy of the department manual available after being asked by different groups for a couple of years. They initially refused to collect demographic data on police interactions, including traffic stops. The department did not make the rules of the police commission available to a new police commissioner. Under pressure from the community, the Shore Police Department has made some tentative steps, but they're still dragging their heels. For example, they're still unwilling to do something as basic as providing police data in a sortable Excel spreadsheet instead of a PDF. Um, third, the lexipol based framework that the police have put forward for the complaint process does not mean the nationally accepted best practice guidelines that our group has been researching. When asked, Chief Nimmer noted that he's not made an effort to learn about nationally known best practices. We find it troubling that a complaint process has been submitted without ensuring that it meets best practice, especially when combined with the provision of inaccurate statute information. And last, there have been questions about police commission involvement in the complaint process. In fact, the police commission currently has the statutory authority and the charge from the existing Shorewood Police Commission rules, Article 5, Section 504, for the commission to review complaints. Meanwhile, the police commission at Fox Point, for example, explicitly states on its webpage that it has the authority, oh, and I'm quoting, has the authority to receive, investigate, and resolve citizen complaints filed against sworn members of the police department, end quote. The process proposed by SPD still does not involve any person or group of other than the police themselves. So the police commission are not included in oversight of the internal police complaint process review. So given these four sets of facts, we strongly oppose the acceptance of the current form of police provided complaint regulations. And we urge the trustees to instead follow the well-researched suggestions provided by our committee. Thank you very much. And I'll remain on the call, but. Anyone else for public comment? Well, so are we going to give the anyone a chance to respond to this, or do we just take the comment and? I was I was planning on just taking comments at this okay. point and getting into right. kind of like we do village board meetings. Any um any other public comments at this point? Otherwise, again, we'll go through the agenda, and I will uh, time if we have time at the end, I will open it back up. Going once, going twice. Okay, why don't we why don't we get into the agenda? Uh, Chief, is this something you're going to lead us through? Sure, I can start. Um, you have several items in your packet this evening. Um, and those are the um, our current complaint process, our policy. Um, in addition to that, you'll see some discussion points that we'd like to talk about today that would lead our discussion. Um, in addition to that, you see a acknowledgement letter of a complete complaint process, as well as a, a draft uh, complaint um, form in that packet as well. And so 
Uh, if we want to start with just the overall discussion of the discussion items that we have listed there, and certainly if there's questions or, or thoughts along the way, uh, please interject and uh, we can address those as we go. Um, so Lieutenant Liebenthal, if you'd like to start on, on those discussion items. Sure, thank you. Um, so as the Chief had mentioned, though, there's some samples there for you to look at in terms of the form and a proposed brochure. Um, once these items are actually looked at, analyzed, and reviewed by, by the commission here, and they're approved, they could be made available online. And the question from our end would be in what format would, would you like them? Would they be like a PDF form, a fillable form, uh, a fillable online form? Um, and what, what thoughts does the commission have in terms of that? Trustee Stoker Branch. Um, so what is standard, what is the protocol nationwide or in the, in the most transparent and accountable, <clears throat> excuse me, areas, what is the recommended, I'm no technology person, so I'm, I have to defer to someone who knows a lot more than me, which wouldn't be much. Um, what's the easiest and best way to make this accessible to people? I don't understand PDF or fillable form online, because the thing would be, obviously, we want the police department to get it as easily as possible. Mm -hmm. And then we want to take the data from it, in my view, without divulging any personal information so that the public can see, oh, someone's got a complaint about a situation on Lake Drive on Tuesday at 10 p.m., right? So it's, I see two accessibility points here for someone getting in and putting in their complaint and for someone saying, wow, I want to know what's going on. Are sure. we talking about, am I talking about the same thing here or am I going too far? Uh, well, I mean, basically the, the, the two different versions that, that I had spoke about with the PDF format, uh, it's an electronic document essentially. Um, and it, it's considered pretty much to be like a universal format that most people should be able to uh, download and, and manipulate or you know, use uh, without having to have certain proprietary software. Like if you had a Microsoft Word document and the person who was trying to fill out the form doesn't have Microsoft Word, they would have difficulty doing that without some other program that would convert the document into something that they could work with. The PDF format is, it basically takes like a snapshot of the, of the document and people can look at it and uh, you can make it so it's fillable in, in and of itself, or you can have it just so that they can print it out and fill it out by hand or however the case may be. The other option would be a fillable form online where we'd have to work with our IT provider uh, to set up a form where people can go in and type in their information and uh, into the various fields, um, make it so that the information gets captured and electronically transferred from there. We've talked so to our IT provider. It's platforms, like, whether you're an Apple user or a Microsoft, you know, you know what I'm saying? Right, it would is all be web -based. available form online more easily accessible to different people using an Android versus a smartphone or I mean, you know, an app, iPhone? Uh, it, pretty much, it, as long as it's web-based, it should be able to, they should, as long as they're able to surf the internet and access the web page, they should be able to, to see it and, and fill it out. Uh, the problem with everything web-based though, of course, is we still have people who aren't really good with technology and don't have access to computers. So having just the form be available online to fill out, do we basically, limit who could file a complaint or a compliment to the department at, at that point in time. So how do you recommend we meet the most, the widest number of choices? How do we meet everybody where they are? As many people as they are with a reasonable eye toward cost and manpower, how do we meet the most people where they are? What do you recommend? If we're talking about doing something online, either the fillable form or the, or the uh, PDF form, whichever would be preferable from the commission standpoint, would, would be uh, acceptable as far as that goes. I still think we'd have to have some paper copies available though for sure. people, you know, and whether it be at the police department or village hall or, you know. But is it, binary? is it PDF or can we not do both? We could probably do both. I, I mean, mean, the paper copy of the form essentially would be just 
a PDF format would be up on, on the actual website. I mean, from, from my perspective, I would, I guess I would strongly, I would strongly prefer, um, I'd strongly prefer that we have a fillable form. I think that that's rather than having, and I, and I do, trust you still around Kathy. I, I agree with kind of having up, having two options would be kind of nice, but you know, my first option, and I think the, the thing that we need to do is build a, a fillable form online. Otherwise you're gonna be stuck in a situation where somebody has to print the PDF, fill it out, um, take it into the police station, which is something we're trying to avoid. I, need, I, I think we want that tech behind uh, fillable fields and then just hit submit so people can do, can, can, can file these types of complaints from the privacy of their own homes, you know, anonymously if they wish. So I think that I understand that there's probably some tech spend there, but I think that's a, a completely worthwhile investment. And I also agree with Kathy in that, you know, we want to give people as many platforms as they can. So if somebody wants to fill, print out the PDF and actually hand it in, um, I would have no problem with PDFing that form and actually having that available online too. And you probably want to keep some paper ones in the, in the office as well. Um, but I imagine that wouldn't be a problem um, as long as they all kind of get to the same place. But my strong preference would be that, that fillable content online. I think that without that, you're, you're really, you're, you're, you're still kind of, you're still behind. You're just, instead of being three steps behind, you're not two steps behind. So I'd prefer to fast forward us and get that fillable form. Trustee Arndorf or anything? Uh, first, sorry for uh, kicking myself out earlier on that. There was a user error on my part. Um, second, yes, I agree with the uh, fillable form um, as well as the PDF option. But yeah, I mean, definitely, here you on the, we need to have a fillable form. Thank you. Trustee Stokerbrand. And then just if maybe we should have this, I don't know if we've got this other places on the form, maybe we do. Um, so Village Hall, you want to have a rack you know, if something, if you want to file a complaint, right? But I mean, we have to figure out where we want them to take it. If they, if they don't want to do it online and they want to submit a paper, where will it all be accepted? If someone feels intimidated and doesn't want to go to the police department, I think we should definitely say, have a Dropbox for a printed PDF and have them there, uh, police complaint, compliment comments. I like the, I like the, the spectrum, right? So let's have a Dropbox in Village Hall, or it could be you could even put it out in the Dropbox with the property taxes and everything else, right? Couldn't we accept them there too? I would yes. hesitate to put it in the Village Center because I'm, my fear then is it would become a library issue and I don't see any need to put them into this. The library staff could direct people to the Village Dropbox in the Village Hall or outside of Village Hall, but I mean, that's just my, that's just my quick take on that. Yeah, I mean, and I, and I agree with that. I think that having a drop box outside of the police station would be nice. And, you know, we can kind of, I, I'm sure village staff can work to figure out exactly where that is, you know. Um, village, the, yeah, police, the, the police station and the village hall. Yeah, yeah. That's not that. village center. Yes. Yeah, I mean, yeah. my, my preference would be the village library staff at village center would direct people to village hall drop boxes. Yeah, or, or if we could use the, uh, I mean, are you thinking, the, like the white drop box in front of Village Hall? Yeah. I would want to check that with, you know, Tyler and Rebecca, but that's just my, it's, it seems like an obvious, it's checked daily, right? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, barring any issues, I think as many receive, I mean, we want to have as many receiving points as possible. Yeah. I'll still agree. Yep. Okay. All right. So then I just uh, want to be clear. We're saying we want online and a printed PDF available at the police station and at Village Hall. Is that correct? I, I, de I, I, de I de ideally, yes. Um, I mean, I don't want to make I don't want to make promises on behalf of Tyler and Rebecca as to what we can and can't do at Village Hall. But I, ideally, I I'm, I'm in agreement. Let's have it available both the police station, uh, Village Hall, and obviously the fillable form online that submits um, to, uh, to to the police department. Thank you. All right. Okay. Uh, moving on to our next item here, then. Um, I know there was talk previously about making the forms and the brochure available in different languages. And it kind of leads to two different questions that we probably need to tackle and, and discuss here. 
Uh, the first, which would be which languages would we be interested in having these forms produced in? Do, do we have a survey as to what languages are the most? I mean, I can, I can guess, <laughs> um, but what languages are the are most commonly spoken outside of English in, in the village of Shorewood or the greater Milwaukee area? I mean, and, and kind of my thought process on this is, if you set up, I, I understand kind of setting up, I'm thinking of almost in terms of a minimum viable product, you know, maybe we start with something like Google Translate, but the, the most common few, two or three languages, and then we expand out and get better because Google Translate isn't always great. Um, but maybe we layer on a better solution when we get, when we can get that in place. Um, but th that's my, my initial thought is to, you know, maybe map it with the languages most commonly spoken, either in Sherwood or the Greater Milwaukee area. Yeah, Trustee Stokebrand. So my guess is that we could work off of what the school district uses, contact the school district and see how many languages they feel, what is our population. You could also use census data, right? And uh, so that should be an easy, an easy do, right? We also have UWM has a translation services program. I am a graduate. In the interest of full disclosure, I think we should pay to have these professionally translated in the languages that are indicated from census data or school district data. Um, pay the money. It can't be that much. Trust me, translators don't make that much. That would be my recommendation. I, I, I actually I agree with you. The only reason that I would the only reason that I would say if, if we need a stopgap where we can't get someone in right away, or for some reason there's some slowdown with actually hiring a translator then I would be okay with using something like Google Translate as a stopgap to make sure we have this available. But I, I agree, I, I'm fully supportive of funding uh, translator services, especially because we're not seeing a, a high volume of complaints. I wouldn't, I would think this would be um, something that would be very manageable from a budgetary perspective. Okay, and one of the things that we had talked about a little internally was with the, the Google Translate option and using that. And uh, for my own, personal experience I, I'm I'm not bilingual I don't speak any any other languages fluently outside of English uh, my daughter however is is minoring in Spanish in college and in the discussion I had with her regarding Google Translate and trying to help my son with his Spanish homework uh, she had mentioned that things don't always translate properly in, in that and so I don't know if that's a, a concern that we don't want to have something get mistranslated and misunderstood in, in that so I think it's something that we should probably think about before we do go down that avenue as far as that goes. Uh, there are the different paid services or the UWM translate uh, uh, department over there that we can potentially utilize. Uh, one of the things outside of just looking at the forms, um, the process overall, uh, one of the things that we had talked about was taking complaints, um, you know, people who call into the, the department and just want to do a complaint over the phone rather than fill out a form and do something more anonymously and language barriers with those situations. And one of the things that we looked at internally was uh, the language line service. It's a, it's a service that we could potentially contract with and they do provide language translations. There's a per minute cost. Uh, their information that they sent to us here indicates that it's, the prices vary by language. However, all the languages that they, included in the information that they sent were 72 cents a minute. Now, I don't know if there's other languages outside of that that are less common that may require a higher fee, but that's something else that the village could potentially look at utilizing to help receive this information in a different form other than written. I'd be supportive of that, Trustee Stoke Brent. So this would be an audio file? Uh, it, it wouldn't necessarily be an audio file. They'd actually have to be online with an individual and convey oh, their so be live. through it through a translator essentially okay that sounds really expensive to me quite honestly having someone live um you know i guess and i could i've been out of the industry a little bit if they write in their native tongue and we find someone to translate it in their native tongue i would think that would be a lot less expensive than doing live written, you know, that 24 seven component. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I would want to know the cost. So you'd have to do the legwork on that staff would have to do the legwork and let me know what the cost difference is. 
if, because I'm not sure. I just want to know. I want to know what it is. Is there a record there created of the actual call, either an audio or a transcribed file? Or is that a separate process from that 72 cent baseline that I think you mentioned for some of the languages? Yeah, that I don't know if they do any written uh, transcript of what was what took in what, what what took place on during the course of the call. I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, I think it would be interesting to understand what the cost implications are, both for you know the call as well as capturing a record. Um, but yeah, just, I think it's better understanding that might be a good place. In addition, to the the spoken over the phone translation, they also do some video interpreting. Uh, mainly more for sign language, but they also do indicate it can be used for uh, verbal as well. And costs for the video interpreting for American Sign Language is two fifty a minute. For Spanish is one eighty five a minute, and all other languages is a dollar ninety five a minute. And, and I was just thinking, you know, in terms of you know that that is I I, I am of course we always have to be cost conscious. I'm thinking that this would be just for if someone calls in and they're, they're speaking a language where we don't have someone on staff who speaks that language, then we call, I'm assuming this is how it works. We call into this, this, this kind of, into, into this uh, call center and they hook us up with someone who can, who can easily translate between the two people talking um, and, you know, take the complaint. And so instead of saying, telling someone, we don't have someone, we don't have someone who can talk to you right now, we can actually call a service, talk to them, get the complaint logged in and then, you know, get it in the process. That's how I, that's how I'm assuming it works. I don't know if that's accurate, but that's what I'm, what I'm here and what I'm, what I would, what I would support. That's correct. Okay. Okay. Um, anything further you want to discuss on that particular item? At this point, no? Okay. Um, Moving on to our next item that we had on our discussions here, uh, discussion points. The perform, proposed form indicates that anonymous complaints will be accepted and also, uh, you know, this information is also addressed in our policy, uh, which is policy 1010.3.2 sub D, um, it's a, which is available out there online. Um, if, if the complaint is anonymous, um, we could provide the complaint with a tracking number, um, it, especially if they're doing it over the telephone with us, we can easily do that. The problem would potentially come in with the anonymous complaints filled in online. We'd have to see if there's a way to generate a tracking number with that, to provide that person a way of following up on their complaint. Because obviously if we don't have their name and phone number, we can't reach out back to them to try to update them with what's going on very easily. You'd almost need to create a field that when they hit submit, it signs a number to the complaint immediately, you know, complaint A1. Um, and then, but obviously it's not going to generate an email or anything. And that person can call in later and say, I, I filed complaint A1. I was wondering what the resolution was. So you'd almost be, need like an immediate text field after, after submission. And you could probably, I mean, I don't think that that's something that has to be just for that, that could probably be something that you use for all complaints. I mean, everyone sure. would have a tracking number. So I think if we just built that as part of the process and may solve that issue, at least hopefully I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a tech, I'm not a tech person. So I'm just hoping <laughs> it's as easy as I think it is. Yeah, that, that's uh, you and me both. And that's something I'd have to probably, we'd have to talk with our software vendor about, uh, you know, to make sure that that's something that can be done. But um, just thinking about it, if it's, an anonymous complaint would be hard to follow up with them without that information. Uh, so, so I guess we just need to know if we're not doing it now with our software, how do we make it happen and what does it cost, right? Are we in the middle of a contract here that we can make changes or where are we with Phoenix, Pro Phoenix? Uh, this would be through our website. Oh, oh, so we do it ourselves. The IT guy and the IT man or woman in Bayside? Is that? Uh, it would go through Tyler through the actual company, is what I'm being told. The who company? Uh, Civic Smart, I think, is the website provider. Oh, okay. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, moving on to our next item on the sample of the 
uh, citizen complaint compliments um, and comment form that, that you have there. You'll notice that the signature line has been removed from the proposed form. Um, this is something that has come up in prior discussions about removing this, the uh, signature line, but then there was also some opposition voice to that. So I, we've, we feel it's important to you know be able to discuss that and see what the, you know, the commission thinks at this point in time regarding that item. I'm, I'm supportive of removal. Well, can't we make it optional? What's wrong with optional? I mean, we, we can have a line on there and say signature is op optional. I mean, That'd be my preference. I mean, I guess I would only oppose. I would only oppose putting it as optional because if it's optional, if we're not really requiring it, it just is another field um, that may make it seem as if it's. <laughs> I don't. I, it's one of those things. It could, it could make it. It could make it seem more required than it is. Um, so I would. I, I would. My support would be to just remove it. But um, yeah. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think we're just sending mixed messages. I mean, either we need it or we don't. So I, and I think the relative importance of that would be open to interpretation. So I, I, I would support removal. Okay, I'll go along for a unanimous decision. <laughs> <laughs> and it kind of ties into, I guess, if you're talking about the people calling in over the telephone and providing the complaint verbally rather than filling out something they're not signing anything and they may not provide us any, you know, information regarding their name or anything like that. So, and we're still receiving those types of complaints as well. So just makes sense, I think. Um, the next item on this actual uh, sample form that you have here, towards the bottom of the form, there is a, a comment on there and this had come up previously about uh, immigration status. And so we, we wanted to point out that we've added to this the language there indicating that regardless of someone's immigration status, contacting the, the village or police department will not lead to an immigration inquiry. Trustee Stokebrand. Trust I'm oh. sorry, so that is true. That's factual, right? I'm sorry, what, what's the question? Is that factual? So we have an example form here that, that it, regardless of what someone's immigration status is, it, by them filling out this form and submitting it, it's not going to lead to an immigration inquiry from our end. So I guess I would leave it. What would be the downside to leaving it? Oh, I, I think they're saying they're, they've are they added it. Oh, I'm sorry, okay. Yeah, they, they were adding it, not, not taking it out. <laughs> okay, and that's true, right? Because it's true. Right, right. Yes. Okay. All right. Moving on. Our form sample form also indicates that all personal information is optional. Uh, there is there is a space on there that they can provide that information if, if they choose uh, regarding race, ethnicity, gender. Um, because I know that there was some discussion about perhaps uh, being able to use the data from that uh, information, but. If someone doesn't want to provide it, they don't have to provide it according to the documentation we have on the form. Is there any well, so discussion? So to have the discussion, right, that's one of the issues is people want to know if, if there's discrimination, race-based discrimination. So if you take the, but there's no way you can force someone, I, you know, because it's done online. So, I mean, it just shows you that the data set is not going to be you know, as accurate as one might hope, because there's there's going to be things we don't know, things we can't prove, right? So, uh, the data set once we get it all, you know, once we let this stuff go um, online, it, it's all got to be with an asterisk that says race is optional, right? And so the data, it's what we've collected. But if people don't put in the information, although I don't know, from body cameras, we should be able to tell, but Hispanic is, I mean, it's, it's, it just shows you where, where the problems come with data. It's, and I think that, you know, I think it's always going to be a balancing act in terms of, it would be great to have perfect data, but I also would, wouldn't want to be in the position of forcing someone to disclose their race, gender, ethnicity, if they were not comfortable doing so. 
so yeah, it's, it's, it's certainly a balancing act, um, acknowledging that, but you know, I, I'm certain I'm in support of keeping it optional. Um, and, and one would think that if the complaint were based upon, um, or were based upon gender, ethnicity, race, that the complainant would say, you know, I am X and I feel like because I am X, I was treated in a certain way. So you would hope that, you know, you would, you, 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 you'll probably get some, you'll probably get a chunk, you'll probably get some information is what I'm trying to say. Um, I don't think everyone will believe that one. Trustee Arndorfer? Yeah, agree. I mean, I, I, I think data and something like this is never going to be perfect and there's always going to be some variability to it, but I mean, if, I, I think it's a step in the right direction. Okay. All right. Um, look, continue to look at the sample form that we have here also. Uh, we've included in there a space for witnesses and third party information. I know that that had come up in previous discussions and we just want to let you know that we've included that in this sample. I, I don't know if there's any comments or concerns or discussion that you would like to have regarding that, whether that's needed, not needed. Um, I mean, I would certainly be in support of including it. I'm, I'm just wondering if you have any perspective based on the experience of other departments in terms of how, how often do people fill out something like that? I mean, how often is information like that incorporated into complaints or is it usually typical, typically um, you know, a single party? Each investigation kind of goes different. on it. Yeah. It all, it, I hate to give you like the, the, no offense to any lawyers, but the lawyer comment of it depends. Well, it, it, it really, it depends on what the situation is. So, um, but I, th I think um, how we have it on the form, it's optional for the person to complete. So again, it's an optional item in a, in a free uh, text field where they could, we could put as much information about any witnesses or um, third party information if they wanted it to. Okay. And also in that same area of the, of the form there, there is, um, I'm sorry, a little bit down further, the second text box on the form there, there's an area to, to have their desired outcome. Uh, what, what is it that they would like to see come from uh, the complaint and investigation that that they're initiating here what what they desire to see as a resolution to the situation got it got it okay so just, just interject shortwood news i do see your hand up i will i'm reserving we took public comments in the beginning and i'm reserving it for the end in the event that we have time so i will call on you first if we have uh if we have time for public comments at the end Trustee Stokobrand? Um, so I think that uh, space for desired outcome is a good idea. I don't see a downside to that. It kind of cuts to the chase, doesn't it? And nobody's beholden to it. It just sort of says, I want an apology. I want, I want to sue. I want, I, I, I don't see, uh, what's, can someone give me the other side of this? I think it's a good, I think it's a good, I agree with you. I think it's a, a good addition to the form. It lets the person, it lets the complainant assign some level of severity to the, to the complaint um, because certainly there could be a disconnect there in terms of um, the person reading the complaint might think it's more or less severe than the person actually submitting the complaint. And that allows for some potential alignment there. Um, so I think it's a good addition. And what does staff, how does staff feel? I mean, I, I think it's a good addition. I, yeah, I do, I do have one question. So if you if you could just switch over to the actual um, complaint form that were that was uh, drafted. And so, can you tell me on the packet what what page we're on? Like around 80, 88, 89? The discussion questions are sixty four. The complaint form itself is sixty five. Thank you. So one of the questions when we had internally is, do you want to break down those boxes for, for instance, for the um, witness information? Do you want the, that text box separate? Do you want together like that we have it? 
you'll see the optional information that we're asking for um, is, is addressed there. Would you like that broken out more or do you want it to be um, kind of all inclusive in that box? Uh, I, I lo was looking, just looking at, we looked at others like Milwaukee Police Department who has it kind of broken out, but again, it doesn't need to be that way. Um, I, I break it into three boxes. Okay. My preference would be to uh, name the person providing the information, address, phone number, race, ethnicity, and gender. Uh, one box, identify the best time to be contacted. Two, box two, and describe your desired outcome, box three. What about the uh, witness stuff, box four? Yeah, I would go with that with the box four. Yeah, witnesses. I just, I just want to make sure that, and maybe mark at the beginning that, you know, all boxes do not need to, it, the, the only thing that I worry about is I, people thinking like, oh my God, I got to fill out all these boxes. Maybe mark at the beginning in bold, all boxes don't need to be filled out. I'm not sure if that's on this, but maybe yeah, just. Yeah, we can, we, can, we can keep the um, optional information to that text box so that they know that this, that that text box is optional. Got it. Because quite honestly, it's all optional up until the point where we just need to know what happened. Right. right so we're kind of leaving it up to them to tell us as little or as much as they would like to tell us quite honestly Justice stoker Brand. and you should put that you could put that in the second sentence after we appreciate compliments feedback blah 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 uh below is the complaint form we are most interested in box number one but if you feel you want to complete boxes two three and four please do so and just put it right up there at the beginning. Is that what you'd want us to do on the poll form? That'd be my record. We can take a vote. I you mean, I think you just make it clear at the beginning. What we need to, to do to resolve this is the basic information of who, what, when, where, why, how, right? And then other information is optional and here are the boxes complete what you're comfortable with or something like that yeah and it's kind of, i mean if you look at the, the the form itself it looks we say describe your comments complaints include names dates locations witnesses third party information other support information and then the below box is optional and so if we just modified those a little bit to address the option just keep the optional information broken out or would you like the actual language in the text? Um, no, you could just start each of the boxes two, three, and four with optional. Okay. Yep. Okay. All right. Um, moving on. Just, just while we're while we're on the complaint form itself, is is there any feedback on the two paragraphs leading into the form? Sorry, I'm I'm toggle, I'm going back and forth in between. Sure. I didn't I didn't see anything. I mean, I can. When I read through it, I didn't see anything that jumped out at me. Um, I can certainly read it again and provide any. I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to start drafting um, here, but I can tell you that I, nothing stuck. Nothing stuck out at me the first time I read it, but I can read it closer a second time and provide feedback again. I don't want to get too far into drafting. Given, given that these meetings go so quickly, but. And again, we'll, we'll, we'll look at that, the, the language on the bottom. And so um, as far as whether or not that language needs to be in there um, yeah. and we'll look we'll at that uh, vetted. Yeah, I, and I think the issue is pursuant to WISTAT 696, uh, 946, whoever knowingly makes a false complaint regarding contact with law enforcement officer is subject to class A forfeiture. I thought that was the only language required but I think we're running into the brochure has this additional language. This department will investigate any all false claims made against this law enforcement officer. No one will make a, but I'm I don't know. I think, Chief, that the brochure you know, is working. I, I, go ahead. I'm sorry for interrupting. I apologize if that language is in the brochure. It wasn't supposed to be there. So that's on us for because that was the old we were we were making changes on the old brochure. Okay. And so um, 
if that made it to the final draft, that's that's um, a mistake. So we'll get to the, we'll get to the brochure, but that shouldn't have made it to the final to the packet. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Let's as, as long as let's just get the statutory language and then square it up where it needs to be. And I don't know. The other question I would have is whether it needs to be both on the brochure and the and the form. We might be able to just pull it all together from the brochure and put it on the form. Or yeah. I guess vice versa if we give everyone the brochure, but we can kind of figure that out process wise. But yes. So my preference would be, I guess, the bottom line and the minimal amount of information so that the, without the extraneous sentence. And if we could just give it once in one place or the other place, um, that would be my preference as well. So trust Yarnbrough for sorry. I, Not that I want to get into drafting either um, on the fly, but I mean, I, I might consider putting the language about, um, um, you know, immigration inquiry that uh, graph under the text box up on top. Um, so maybe a third, you know, instead of two intro graphs, uh, maybe make that the third. Um, that's not a hard lock or anything like that, just a consideration. Um, Cause I imagine that could be a question that someone's gonna have up front before they fill out the information. Uh, with regard to the um, brochure, I mean, by you know, just from a design standpoint, I don't, I don't know if we, I mean, I'm agnostic as to whether we need that language on there regarding uh, 946. I wouldn't highlight it in blue as it appears in this draft, just because it seems to make it more important than it actually is. So I, I'm not, not that it's not important, but I, I guess either everything has a box or nothing has a box. I, I, would, I would say otherwise it just kind of, I'm not sure how it'd be, it, it could be interpreted negatively otherwise, I think. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I, mean, I know the requirement for that language is conspicuous for, for the statute. Um, so, you know, if we're kind of looking, if we're having the attorney look at exactly what the language is, maybe we also say, you know, how conspicuous do we have to be in order to comply with the statute? We just keep it. Right, you can knock type size down, you know, yeah. typographical devices you can use to make it not seem as big, but it still meets the legal requirement. Yeah, and, and I, just, I do want to emphasize, I apologize, that was not meant to be on the final, on the, on the final draft that was given to you. So that was an error on our side. Well, thanks. I think we are. Uh... And I will certainly get that just clarified and make sure that we everything is squared away on that end. Thanks, Chief. Okay. Is there is is there anything else about the brochure itself? And 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 I think it's important the the, the language in there. I tried to sync that language up with a policy, and um, uh, and the brochure, and then. Um, the language from the complaint um, form. While it's not completely all, it's all at least intertwined a little bit and not, because I know that there was, again, from the past brochure, which I looked at by the way, which was a brochure that was here before I got here and this carried over into my tenure. And so when we went back to find it, um, that's where we found the, the, uh, the, the original brochure. And so we took out some of that language that was, I guess, not consistent with either our policy or um, didn't, you know, sync up to where we want to be, um, making sure that we're getting the the feedback that we want to get back. So, but if there's anything in the brochure, I'd, I'd put an area for some ideas there. If, if anybody had anything, if you'll notice on the form, it does say the library would be available at the library, but it sounds like that is not wanting to be an option so and that's okay i can take that out of there yeah and i mean maybe i do respect you know the fact that we don't we we can't just you know public safety can't just say library are going to do this but i mean if they're open to doing it it would be great if they would so i, I mean maybe it's i i think that it's a good idea that we, we would need to make sure that they were that the library was okay with doing it otherwise it's a very it's a very short distance between the library and the Dropbox. Trustee Stokerbrand? I agree, but I think we just have to acknowledge that there's a lot of people who use the library that maybe have never been in Village Hall. And so with you know, with checking with Rachel, it'd be a quick uh, a quick way to find out if she how she'd feel about that. 
Yeah. And couldn't you put it in that outside hallway with a, a lock, like a Dropbox? You know, I'm always I'm a little confused about the boundaries between the library and the village center. And but there is a lot of community information in that lobby, and that seems to me like it would be a, a good place because, as I said, there's a lot of people that use the library in Sherwood that don't ever go to Village Hall. Yeah, that's my yeah. understanding. Yeah, it's one of those things where I don't want to get too far out over my skis and start, you know, yeah. oh, we can put it there, we can put it there, you know, but it would be, my, my position is that it'd be great to have have the ability to drop the, the form any, in as many places as possible. But again, I do think we need to talk to Rachel about what we can and can't do. And I, I just don't know off the top of my head. So I, my next question gets into the complaint disposition. And so we have somewhere in here about the 90 days, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, that'll be in there. Uh, and then we get to the the question about what happens if you're not happy with the, I guess I, this is where I'm looking for, um, maybe that's a discussion coming later on number 10. Um, maybe we should finish number nine before we get to 10. I know time is running short. Sure, sure. Um, just, just just to address, I will, I will talk with Rachel about the library. Um, and, and get that information for, for you. Got it. So ideally you would have the police station, village hall and the village center, right? For Dropbox plus Correct. online, yep. right? Correct. Correct. And at a minimum for the police department and village hall. Yep. Correct. And online. And online. Okay. All right. Moving on to number nine, our contact with the complainant. Um, there is included in the packet there a sample, uh, a draft of an acknowledgement letter that could be provided to the individual making the complaint. Um, you can just see the language that's in there, basically just acknowledging that we've received the complaint and, you know, giving them some contact information from there. Um, one of the things that you know, one of the questions would be with this, is this something that if we are providing them with a tracking number, do we need to do this particular document on top of that or separate from that? Or should this only be used for situations where people are calling in to file their complaint rather than documenting it on paper or through the internet? Um, how would you prefer us to proceed with that? I would imagine if there's any way we could send, like, this is, this is my dream world, like an email for people who are not anonymous, kind of an email confirmation of acknowledgement of receipt. For people who are acknowledgement, you get, you get a tracking number. Um, and people who you have email to them, I mentioned they would get a tracking number as well. Um, and then, you know, maybe generate a letter in some way for people who are not kind of online. Um, so, I mean, just, just kind of, I realize that's three channels, so it's getting a little complex, but I don't, given the volumes, I think maybe we can pull it off. I mean, the only thing I would ask too is, do we want to, in addition to kind of those acknowledgements, do we want to supply targeted 30-day updates to people who complain? It? I don't know what kind of manpower or, you know, technical um, wizardry that would take, but it would be nice, if, I mean, if we could supply, you know, if a complaint takes 90, I would suspect that most of these don't take 90 days. I would suspect that most are within that, but if it's, it does take up to 90 days, it'd be nice to get monthly updates on what was happening. I would suspect most are, the vast majority are resolved within the month. Um, but if it, I would love to have a process by which 30, 60 days, there were also personalized updates provided to people. So if, I, if I'm hearing you correctly, so if, if it's a, if it's, if we know the complainant's name and contact information, we would then provide them with an acknowledgement. If it's anonymous, they would get a tracking number and we will obviously wouldn't be able to send them anything, but maybe update it. So we could talk to the vendor to see if there's a way to update it through that tracking number so that they could get a response. I don't know if that would be feasible, but we can check. Yeah, I would think with anonymous, they don't, they'd have to rely on the department's monthly report and go to their Go to their tracking number or even call in or something i don't know if there's if we don't have their information there's no real personalized way, personalized way to do it if we have someone's contact information though we could we could auto generate in addition i imagine we would sign assign them a tracking number too but we could auto generate um responses 
they would they obviously wouldn't be auto auto generated responses they'd be personalized but at 30 and at 60 days okay okay and, and you know again the, the goal is to complete all of these within 90 days which is currently within our policy at, at the moment here um moving on to number 10 information that could be included within the monthly report um obviously number of complaints received, uh, the nature of the complaint. We kind of touched on a little bit before about the race, ethnicity, and gender, where if that information is known, the numbers may not match up. You know, if say if we get five complaints in a month and we don't only have race, ethnicity, and gender information for three of those, you know, people have to understand that there may be a discrepancy between those two figures. Um, as far as that goes. Uh, the disposition of the complaint would be another thing that could potentially be captured onto the monthly report. I guess the, the question is, what, what information do you want to see on the monthly report? I guess, so I guess a couple questions on this for me, you know, you know, I understand what if we, you know, my thought process is that the police commission maybe it would be something where it was, uh, you know, a meeting to discuss the complaints on a certain meter. And again, we'd have to figure out what, what, how many complaints we got per per year to, to figure out what that meter was. Whether it was, um, whether it was, you know, once every couple of months, or once, you know, once or twice a year. But you know, but I, I guess my question would be: so if we wanted to look at that, which would be, I don't think it's something that's contained in the in the current. I mean, there, there's 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 reference to complaints provided to the police commission, but it's not specific to their uh, to their organization or the articles of organization. So, if we were to look at a broader police commission role, role and just kind of taking these complaints, you know, meeting about not, not taking, you know, meeting about and hearing summaries of the complaints and you know asking questions, is that something that re that we do here as part of this study, or is that something that we we, we move up to the board level and say? Um, we want to look at kind of expanding the police commission's role um, to things that are referred to in the articles, but not necessarily explicit. So we might need to do some rewriting there. So that's kind of a general question of mine, because I, I would like, I, I think there's an opportunity there to involve more people in this, in this process and kind of resolve issues as they come up. Yeah, I guess I, I would agree with that. I mean, I'm kind of... Part of me says, we, can we finish the complaint? This is why to me, this is taking a little longer than maybe all of us would like is, do we include on the complaint form, if you're not satisfied with the result of your complaint, you have an option for an informal complaint process through the police commission. So if we, if we stop this now, this is my question. If we stop this now to work on the police commission component and the role they could or would play in this, we could hold this up for a long time because there's a lot to discuss here about the role of the police commission. In my view, in this community, this is not a simple question with any simple answers. So in my view, the question is, do we let this complaint form go ahead without any mention of the police commission just to get the improved complaint form out and then go back and revisit it later after we've had the discussion about the role of the police commission? That's what I'm tending I would like to hear you, you know, Trustee Warren and Trustee Arndorfer, I'd love to hear your input, but I think there's it's such a clamor for this complaint process, at least at this point, what would be the downside to letting this new form go out and starting to, you know, work with it and then have the community discussion about the police commission with the commission? I mean, I have not, you know, I, I think I need to be in a conversation with in an open session on the record with members of the police commission to see how they feel. Yeah, and maybe, maybe that's, um, you know, maybe that's something that we do. I, I'm thinking that if we want to expand or make more active the police commission, then, you know, I understand that traditionally it's had a certain role, but if we want to expand that role or expand um, the role of, uh, or expand, expand what, what they do or what they're, what they're charged with doing and rewrite the articles. I don't know if that's part of the study or something that we, we just, do an item for future consideration. We say we're going to put this on the board agenda, and again, I, I can't speak for the whole board. Uh, send it to either talk about it with the police commission 
or talk about it at a cow and just say, you know, this is what we want them to do and maybe direct staff to, to kind of redraft the articles in accordance with you know, what we can do under the statute. So I, I, I guess I don't want to get, I want to know if I'm too far outside of the study to do it here or whether I'm within the study to do it here. And I'm kind of curious, I don't know who exactly answers that, but I might do an item for future consideration just so we can kind of try to muddle through. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely want to have a broader conversation about the role of the police commission. My, my bias would be to try to move on this piece as soon as possible. We can evolve as needed, but I, I mean, to, I, I agree with Kathy's points. And, and I don't, I, I, conceptually, I don't have a problem with getting a, a minimum kind of, a, we'll call it, call it a, a minimum viable product, even though it's, it's, it's more than that, I, I get it. Um, but I just want to make sure that this doesn't become like where we stop here. Um, so I, I, I mean, I, I do want to get, we need to get this complaint form online. Um, we need to get this complaint form online um, and, and, and modernize that. But we also do need to try to, we want to make sure that, or I stand the ball. Maybe that's maybe the police commission issue is just something we you know later on tonight we talk about an item for future consideration and we and we say uh, you know this is something we're going to discuss in July or second meeting in June or you know whenever we can schedule it. But I just want to make sure that um, we don't kind of stop we don't we don't do something and then stop the discussion. Totally agree. Yeah, I have no intention of stopping. I just. I would rather get something moving forward than holding everything up until we have the police commission discussion because it's such a larger, a larger discussion. Because it, I mean, we have to decide, in my view, we have to decide, do we want everyone to go through the police review process first with a complaint comment compliment? And then after that is exhausted, then do we want someone to give someone the option of, if you're not happy, here's your next option. Or do we say, oh, the minute you file your complaint with the police department, you can also file it with the police commission. I don't, is it, does that happen anywhere? I don't know. Um, that's yeah. Which is why I think we need probably a, a bigger policy-based discussion at the board right. level. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, you know, I don't think that we know exactly where we want to take this. I mean, I, I am I'm in support of enlarging the role of the police commission. Um, but I think that we probably need the board to say how we want to enlarge it and then figure out how we want to redraft these articles to reflect that enlarged role, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the complaint process. But again, I'm not so sure that that's part of this study. That might be something that might be taken up by the board and kind of direct, um, direct village staff to, to kind of implement what our policy recommendation or our policy direction is. I would agree because I have a hard time dumping a huge new responsibility onto the police commission that they haven't previously done for whatever reason. I'm not going to go back into who did what and what they didn't do and why. I'm just saying looking forward, I am not comfortable saying we want you to all do this, but we don't know what you want you what we want you to do, how you should do it, and what you should do with it at the end of the day. I just I'm not ready. Now, and maybe, maybe again, maybe it becomes an item for future consideration where we just we have a cow on it when we can fit it in and we figure out exactly what we want the police commission to do. And then we can we can invite the police commissioners in order to exactly. To I think we discussion. need to have the police commission and with have a cow and invite the police commission. Yeah, I mean, maybe that's the easiest way to, to tackle this because I do think that you know, yeah, you know, sorry, Chief and Lieutenant, I'm sorry, we're getting I think we're getting a little afield from I think it connects to the study and I think it connects to the, the what we're trying to do here, but I think that it's probably a little bit outside of where where we where we you know kind of the you know getting this in place and that in place and the other thing in place. But it, I think it's a vitally important piece of the complaint process here. Um, and the only other thing I would mention, and again, I realize we're three minutes over time. Um, I just want to acknowledge the comments on you know the, the policy manual. I understand that we've used Lexapol, and that's that's um, the other that's kind of the policy setting. That's 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 where we based our police policies. I, I would be curious as to whether there are other kind of other policies which might uh, you know bring another viewpoint on kind of equity considerations. And I can take that offline and have that discussion um, with, with you, Chief, or you, Lieutenant. I think that you know I, I understand. I want to be respectful of time, and we have to get to a budget meeting, which we're five minutes over. But I do want to continue that discussion at some point. 
Do you want me to bring back the um, updated comments and the complaint form and the brochure to the next meeting? Yes, please, if you could. Okay. And also, I, I'd like to hear kind of if there's any way to get a timeline on when we can get this up and running and implemented. If Tyler, if Tyler could bring back kind of the like when will our webmaster or whatever, whatever, they're, whatever they're called, be able to really imp to implement this because I think this is again I agree with Trustee Arndt for Trustee Stoker Brand that this is something that we, we do want to get in place as soon as we can. So any further and I apologize. I apologize. Uh, Chuck Shorewood News, I, I see you, but unfortunately we're five minutes over. So um, if you want to submit comments to the Public Safety Committee kind of offline, we'd, be, we'd, we'd love to hear them. I, I do apologize though we have to, we're going to have to get to the Budget and the Finance Committee meeting. I'll make a motion to adjourn. We have motion to adjourn. Any second? Second. Motion second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Meeting is adjourned. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Lieutenant. And uh, with that, I uh, hand uh, bye bye. Hand it over to our Chair of Budget and Finance Committee, Trustee Stokebrand. Is it the same Zoom? We're on the same Zoom. Okay. Thank you. Uh, it's seven oh five. I will call the Budget and Finance Committee to order on June seventh, twenty twenty one, and we're going to consider revenue diversification options. And I think, let's see, is that on page 90 of the packet? And I'm looking for, um, I see Director Emanuelson. Uh, would you like to start us off, please? Sure. Uh, this is really um, a follow-up meeting from our uh, budget outlook that we did at the, uh, it was a cow. Uh, a few weeks back, uh, gives the committee an opportunity to take a little more in-depth look at, there's uh, four primary revenue diversification options that have kind of been on the, on the radar, if you will, for the last several years. And uh, if there's any interest in moving forward in these, you know, we'd like to um, begin that process. And uh, so we can get prepared and then, uh, uh, be in a position when we get into the budget cycle to have incorporated uh, the, the decisions that have been made either here or uh, if recommendations come out of the committee, uh, hopefully the village board will have an opportunity to act uh, relatively promptly. So materials are all the same. So I, I guess I'll turn it over to committee members for their discussion and however you want to uh, pursue this. Uh, Trustee Stoke Brand. Thank you. I guess I'd, I if there I will follow the the lead of Trustee Warren from the previous committee meeting. Um, now that time is a little bit of the essence, we've got about twenty minutes. Uh, is there anyone from the public that would like to speak about the possible adoption of a, a revenue opportunity? I don't see any hands. Okay, um, I guess we could go around the table. Um, Trustee Arndorfer, Trustee Warren, your initial thoughts about, I believe there were four presented, the parking meters, refuse collections, fire protection, and I'm missing one, uh, the wheel tax. Um, and the overriding goal here is to, um, if you wanna just briefly, the structural deficit that we're trying to, trying to fix, but, and so what the structural deficit, would this at all be affected once we finally get out of the debt stabilization situation? Uh, issues? You know, debt stabilization uh, in the long term will, will lead to lower debt service in, in out years uh, based on uh, the projects we've got currently scheduled, uh, but doesn't have really a direct relationship to these types of considerations. Again, the, the initial concepts are driven uh, by the desire to diversify uh, alternate revenue sources from the tax tax levy. Um, there are some um, additional impacts with the various choices, be it uh, um, 
levy limit capacity, expenditure restraint capacity, um, you know, the, the impacts of being able um, to more aggressively manage our refuse and recycling collections activities. Um, all those are, are broadly summarized in the, uh, in the memos that, uh, uh, staff memos that uh, highlight each one of those uh, revenue, vers revenue diversification uh, considerations. So um, it's really, again, you know, is there, is there any general will to move forward on these? Um, and if so, uh, you know, this would be the time to uh, express that and then uh, get that before the board and then we can be prepared to move forward. There's uh, the refuse utility would be difficult to implement in the 2022 budget year. Uh, not impossible, but difficult. Uh, parking meters is definitely a multi-year cycle, uh, but the um, wheel tax and the uh, public fire protection fees would, would be both possible to implement in, for the 2022 uh, budget cycle. And don't we... Don't Warren. sorry, my camera went what? on. Don't we need to implement something for 2022? I mean, isn't that don't we don't we run into expenditure restraint? I mean, don't doesn't it kind of make a little bit doesn't it narrow down our choices? Um, well, you, you cut out there, Trustee Warren, but I'll I'll summarize that um, moving forward, particularly with the public fire protection in 2022 does give the board a lot of additional options when considering uh, restoring uh, a, a larger uh, share of annual revenues to, to capital budgeting, which is really what creates the, um, the, the, the challenge as far as maintaining our expenditure restraint eligibility. Uh, we, we, we can't do both. Well, we, I take that, we need to do both. We can't do one or the other. So, Say that again. We can't do both meet. Double cuts. We, we can't restore the funding for capital to what staff is recommending to long-term levels and maintain our expenditure restraint eligibility. Um, now, again, is there always a way? Yes, there's always a way, but deferred Continuing deferred capital funding is not where staff is going to start for recommendations. Um, if we were to move towards a public fire protection, number one, it does not count against the levy limit. Number two is it frees up expenditure room within the general fund that can be leveraged to allow the restoration of a significant portion of the annual capital funding that staff believes necessary and still maintain our expenditure restraint eligibility for $260,000 of state grants. So it sort of seems like the state lawmakers have set us up to follow this path and many communities have before us. We are definitely a lagging community in this regard, yes. I mean, and you're talking about the fire, the fire protection piece, right? Moving that over to... To the utility bills, yes. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess my... Uh, my, my position is, I, I think we, I, I like to stay, I can stay consistent with myself. You know, I'm not, I, I, have, I have problems with the kind of regressive nature of the wheel tax and the, and, and the, the parking meters. Um, so my, you know, I guess my preference would be, especially for a lagging community uh, for the fire protection piece, I would, I would that, that would be something that we'd want to look at. I know conservation committee um, has talked about the refuse utility and kind of a, a pay, pay as you throw uh, type deal. So that might be something, you know, given, given our emphasis on environmentalism in, that, in this community, that might be something we want to look at as well. Um, and the other pieces, you know, the smaller pieces in the, the first part of the memo, you know, those, those, I, I, I understand the need to kind of look at everything individually. And we certainly will do that at budget time, but some of those strike me as a lot of, it's not getting us to where we need to go very quickly and causing a lot of, um, kind of painful solutions for not getting us not getting us a lot of traction in terms of where we need to go so sorry for the kind of holistic comments um but wanted to provide my overall thinking as i read through the memo uh trustee arndorfer otherwise i was going to ask mr liberatory to if he could comment a little bit on the the refuse but i want to give the trustees an opportunity first 
Yeah, I mean, just in the interest of brevity, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm supportive of looking to move forward on, um, you know, public fire protection charges slash fees. Um, interested in uh, refuse collection, really want to understand how we could impact, you know, or mitigate impacts on that, of that on folks and just get a better understanding of what that's going to mean for different, you know, different residents, right? Um, you know, what are the various impacts? Um, I mean, I, I personally, I see a wheel tax as a wheel tax, ref, a wheel tax is a non-starter. I mean, I recognize it's a referendum, but it's not something that I can support. Um, and, um, you know, I, I see the, you know, I see the issues with parking meters. However, I, I would be supportive of exploring that as an option moving forward. I mean, especially, you know, after looking at um, some of the last budget, um, issues that we're dealing with. So, I mean, I, I think that should be something that's put on the table. Thank you. And I would tend to agree that I could support the fire, public fire protection, moving it to the um, utility bill, the water utility. Uh, my next choice would probably be, although I really, I would like to know the cost of getting the trucks, getting the dump, the trucks so that when they pick up, I mean, if it by weight or volume, um, that's my question is what, what would be the downstroke payment for getting trucks that would measure volume or weight um, to do the refuse collection one and the parking meters um, as unappealing as it seems it's better to me than we're already being paying a wheel tax to the county. Um, Silver Spring has a parking meters Downer Avenue has parking meters. I think it would be a way to help, you know, people from outside of the village you come to the village uh, to help support the village. Um, but it would, you know, it would come after the, the good thing about the water fire protection utility is you are getting people who are tax exempt to help contribute to fire protection, you know, nonprofits and um, schools and churches and, um, and I, I would support that. So um, I don't Mr. Liberatory, did you have anything that you'd like to add quickly about uh, sure. his collection? Uh, yeah, um, well, I, mainly I just want to thank you, Trustee Soberband. I just wanted to make sure that everybody received the memo that Tyler forwarded on um, the Conservation Committee's behalf. Um, I put that together somewhat in haste because I didn't know about this meeting until Thursday. Um, so I just wanted if, to see if there were any questions about that. I mean, the main uh, argumentative side here is that, of course, in order to start incentivizing or penalizing, depending on how you want to look at it, uh, waste reduction or you know waste patterns in the village, uh, we we would need some way of establishing a price, a, a base price for um, for refuse collection. So, our interest in Mark's proposal here uh, and some of these explorations um, is is principally because. It, it, we found that in other communities, the first step to beginning to set that price and then figuring out how you can uh, nudge behaviors in the in the direction that we want um, is to move move waste collection off of the um, off of the property tax suite of services. So, so that's it. I just wanted to see if there are any questions about that argument, and I'd be happy to address them either here or later by email or a phone call. So I, can you just in generally tell me how long does this take for a community of our size to make that transition? Well, that, that I don't know. Um, and I guess I would defer to the finance department's uh, projections here since it's, I think the complicated part is, is probably shifting over the, um, you know, the billing and the finance piece. I, I, as I understood from looking at this closely with um, finance in previous years, is that you know Sh Shorewood's existing DPW infrastructure and staff would sort of just be uh, you know sort of repackaged under the utility model. Um, so the conservation committee isn't really steeped in all of those financial and technical details. We're more interested in. Um, the sustainability benefits of moving away from a one-size-fits-all waste collection model. So it would, um, it would intrinsically change the way our DPW works in terms of 
Because would you, would you subcontract that out to a company that weighs and measures? Or would well, uh, you RDP? Uh, no, I, you know, I'll just add to the, the general thought that, you know, there's multiple steps the community can take to move down the path. I think as Josh initially said, the, the first step is to start um, a fee for service collection of, of refuse that's not supported by, you know, and buried within the, 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 the general tax levy. So that people become aware of the cost of those services. Once that's in place, um, and, and from a municipality, we can use average household costs. We take our current budget and we just divide it by our average household costs. And, and um, again, the, the, the goal would be to start setting aside a little reserves to, to replace our, our collections equipment. Um, uh, but from that, you know, once that's in place, then we can really start looking at, you know, what are a couple different alternatives that would um, encourage alternate behavior patterns uh, uh, that does not have to happen from the onset. Our, equi our current equipment is relatively new, although it is a very heavy use uh, apparatus. So um, it, it's, it, we're gonna be looking at equipment replacement or, or other refuse options in the near future, uh, two, three years from now, maybe even sooner. So, um, you know, we can, we can develop uh, and get a sense for what those options are once, once we got the baseline step taken and that's to create a refuse utility. That and I think, Mark, uh, Mark, correct me if I'm wrong, but when we initially proposed this or we're working with your office on sort of figuring out how it would mechanically play out, we were envisioning a three phase rollout and each of those phases would be two calendar years or two budget years, I guess. Um, so it, uh, to answer your question, uh, Trustee Strokebrand, I think in our initial proposal, we were looking at like a six year uh, transition. The first two years would be occupied by moving to the base price, um, sort of just to get the utility in, um, in play. And then the second and third phases would begin to introduce service options and incentives. And so you would have perhaps one for recyclables, one for garbage is not recyclable, one for garbage that's recycled, and maybe one for yard waste or so-called natural, whatever. Would that are those like categories? Are those ways to break it down? Well, I, I think recyclables and, and refuse are utilized by all reference all residents. I think the yard waste component would be challenging because that is you know, responding to whatever's put on the curb at this prescribed time of year. So, uh, but we can, again, once we've got the format in place, we can, we can then begin discussions on, you know, in that next year leading towards year three, you know, what, what is the desire of the community um, and final, you know, really answer more of those questions that are um, pertinent to those, those discussions. And I guess another question for me is, once we do all of the sorting and charging, um, who would be the quote unquote winners and losers? And is there a market for, I mean, I think there's a real, a real issue right now with where to take recyclables, plastics, right? So is, there, is it worth separating and sorting and charging if there's nobody that will take it? Does that have a role in our decision making? Again, you know, the, the village is going to pay the same cost under either model. Um, the, the trick is, is to find ways to change Sorry. behaviors that, in, that reduce landfill and in, improve recycling and, and reward those who participate um, and or, again, the, the counterpoint to that is to penalize those who do not. Um, or, or at least make them pay a, a higher share of the overall cost. So uh, we're not gonna get into additional sorting. I mean, that's still gonna be given to one of our primary processors in the region. Um, and those markets have, have changed in the last five years. They may change again in the next five years. It, it's so hard to say. And then compost obviously would be a different one altogether, right? A whole nother category, the compost. It's another consideration once we've got the base format in place, right? It just, it seems to me it's, this is part of the whole DPWAR discussion. Um, 
but yeah, so this is farther out than um, than the other ones, I think. Um, all right, uh, any more discussion? Uh, anyone else from the public have any comments or um, discussion from the committee members? Uh, seeing none, is anyone prepared to, to make a motion or would you like more discussion? Well, there's, there's one possible motion for each of those items if any there's any interest in moving forward in those. A suggested motion, please. <laughs> I guess the so I guess the one that drove really had consensus was the uh, the, the move to author the public service commission approval, the water utilities. Is that I think I believe so, yeah. I think we both we have Trustee Arndorfer and I have said I believe that that's one that we could we could support. Yeah, and I think you're right that the refuse seems a little bit further out. Um, and this one seems more immediate, but so. I guess I mean, I would... I think it's important to acknowledge that you know this this means that this is a this is a tax increase to the average average homeowner of eighty to ninety dollars a year, and um, it's not something I do lightly. But in light of the situation, it seems um, I think it is fair to ask the organizations that pay no property taxes to help submit the fire, the fire protection. And I think that some of the justification, unfortunately with, with some, some of the tax changes mean that it's more palatable to move, to move this off the property tax rolls since a lot of that became with, uh, with the last tax changes in the tax code and I think 2017 became undeductible, so. Right, up to 10,000, right? Yeah, the, the limitations there, so. Uh, depending, so I will, depending on the level of your taxes, otherwise it, it could be undeductible. I shouldn't make that assumption, but you know. Right. So I will make a motion to authorize staff to seek public service commission approval to place the water utilities public fire protection charges on the utility bill effective 11 15 of 21. I'll second that. And this would uh, this would be a recommendation to the board, is that correct? That's correct. All right, uh, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? And I guess um, we'll take an informal vote. I don't believe anyone is taking, um, all in favor say aye or raise your hand. Aye. Aye. Okay, the and motion passes three to nothing. And just as a brief recap, if, if you want to engage in additional discussions on these other items, it doesn't have to always be just this once a year. I mean, we, we can revisit these at, at a later point. Uh, you would schedule it for your committee and then uh, and, and maybe we can focus in on, on a specific item to see again, you know, start looking at timetables and, and things like that uh, so that you know, if you're prepared for 2023, maybe you have to start in, you know, mid to late 2021 to be comfortable making those decisions by the time it's ready for the 2023 budget cycle. Yeah, I, I would be supportive of keeping that conversation going. I, I appreciate your time on this. Okay, thank you very much. And um, we have a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. A motion and a second. All in favor say aye. We get three minutes before aye. we start again. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Manuelson. Thank you.